Now comes forth the true story of the Ryman's, Tom and Betty, from the archives of their life together as portrayed in the show, The Ryman Diaries. It began in 1855, when teenage Tom and his father John began a fishing business from a small rowboat on the Cumberland River in Nashville, Tennessee. But unlike the solitude of that small boat, our nation was in turmoil. U.S. Senator Stephen Douglas had just prevailed in passing into law the Kansas-Nebraska Act, allowing the spread of slavery into the new emerging states. By 1858, consternation amongst citizens had grown into skirmishes and firefights in Kansas, spilling over its borders into Nebraska, Iowa, and Missouri. Brother against brother was becoming the norm. Then on April 14, 1861, with the firing on Fort Sumter, the United States of America entered into a full-scale, all-out war with itself. The genteel times of the childhood of Betty Ball in Franklin, Tennessee were to suddenly and forever change. For this war was to be fought in the farm fields and backyards of children at play. Boys as young as 12 would run off or be conscripted to be drummer boys. Homes were disrupted if not lost altogether and little Betty Ball began to write. Write about the war and her family's experiences with it. Right, not unlike a little girl of her same age did 80 years later when Anne Frank penned her diary chronicling the ravages of another epic war. But unlike Anne Frank, Betty Ball was gifted with a life beyond the war, well beyond. When during the Battle of Franklin, she miraculously survived a cannonball flying through her upstairs bedroom window. And from the ashes of that terrible civil war, as Betty melds into a refined young college student, she continues the accounts of her life for another 60 plus years. She details in flourishing language her chance meeting with a crude, rough-edged river rat of a young man named Tom Ryman struggling to explain their awkward courtship and eventual marriage. We learn that the couple's first three children were raised from infanthood on the family's riverboat home. We learn of Tom's gentler side and his deep love for his family and his love of music as he lullabies his children in the evening before bed. For in Tom's belief, music feeds the soul. simple motto to be sure, but for sure foretelling. When inspired by evangelist Reverend Samuel Porter Jones, he launched into a decade-long mission to build the Union Gospel Tabernacle, a tabernacle so acoustically artful for its day that it has rarely been matched in those built since. Now let's look in and see how mid-age Betty Ball Ryman is managing her home, her six children, and her challenges with her husband's newfound popularity in her 1885 household. The other day I was observing the goings on down there. Oh, I forgot to tell y'all. I, I got myself a spyglass so I keep an eye on the captain. He's down there. And I caught a glimpse of that businessman from Louisville, the one who's putting in the railroad. He was meeting with my Tom on the riverfront along with some woman he called his daughter. <laughs> And I caught her flirting with my Tom behind that fancy Japanese fan of hers, brazen hussies. 
I can just imagine him strolling the deck with one lovely young thing after another while I'm stuck up here peeling and chopping and yes, spying through my spyglass. <coughs> I'm going to do something about this. Hmm. Mirror, mirror in my hand. Who's the fairest in the land? Oh, it's not me, and there's nothing fair about it. All right, children, just settle down. I know it's hot. I know it's hot. Now listen, we're, we're going to be leaving in just a few minutes, I think. My cat's out. All right, now children, just please stay put. Do not go outside. Just, just, just stay where you are, Tommy. Go get dressed. The rest of you just stay here. Yes, the rest of you can sit someplace between you and your mother. Just stay here, stay put, now. <laughs> well, Captain Thomas Green Ryman, looks like you will be escorting Mrs. Ryman and your six children to the tent meeting to hear the Reverend Sam Jones. And who knows, Captain? With a little luck, it just might be a hot time in the old town tonight. <laughs> Red Hot Betty. Red Hot Betty. And thus the family went to a meeting. A meeting held in a hot, stuffy, mildewish old tent. So abhorrent was the tent, and so inspiring was Reverend Jones, that in Tom's eyes, he had no other choice than to build that tabernacle. Jesus had called me softly and tenderly. Jesus still calls me. Now let us pour our song sheet out from our program tonight and raise our voice in praise. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. And so, from a tent to a tabernacle was launched. A seven-year stint of fundraising, construction, construction setbacks, more fundraising, more construction, and finally, in June of 1892, a complete functioning structure. And for the next twelve years, Tom Ryman saw to it that all manner of God-spirited events filled that tabernacle. Ministers of the gospel from all Christian faiths, gospel and opera singers, graduations, conventions, reunions, election night results, Nashville civic needs, theatrical openings, basically anything he could bring Jesus to and help eliminate the debt of the building. And when his health failed in 1904, Tom contracted a service firm to do likewise. The firm assigned a 29-year-old widow, Lula C. Naff. Lula stayed at her post for 50-plus years and ultimately brought in something as God-fearing as hillbilly music. Now we all know the result, Music City, and to think that it all started from a boy fishing out of a rowboat. But there again, that's where Jesus started. Forty years have now passed since we listened to Red Hot Betty Ball Ryman. Let's peek in and see what she's up to in 1925. Hello, folks. This old Uncle Jimmy Thompson. I'm going to play you a fine quadrille, the Lanford Day of August in 1860. <laughs> I wonder if there's any way Tom could know that, that something would happen right here in Nashville, Tennessee that would change music forever. But most of all, I wonder if Tom Ryan knows that this building that he gave 10 years of his life to is now known the world over as the Ryman Auditorium. Don't miss the history, the humor, the drama, and the music of the Ryman's. Treat yourself. Come 
see the Ryman Diaries on stage at a theater near you.